I would uh, like to introduce, and my pleasure to introduce uh, Pete Warden, CEO of Useful Sensors. And as the name uh, suggests, wow, it's really built for the future of AI, future of industrial AI. It's, it's impactful, it's useful, and simple. And you wonder why not more of these companies exist. Uh, Pete uh, completed his PhD here at Stanford, and his, uh, us. <laughs> his at least I know you completed your bachelor's uh, at the University of uh, Manchester in, in computer science. Pete has done enough work for three PhDs. He's just here to get the piece of paper. <laughs> well, uh, when I saw the whole uh, bachelor's in University of Manchester, I was hoping that we can get along very well if you're a United supporter. <laughs> Uh, so, so let me again welcome Pete. He's also was the former uh, CTO and founder of Jetpack, that was acquired by Google. And during his time at Google, he worked on embedded systems and mobile systems. A culmination of that work was Tiny ML, as you are pretty aware of it. And so, let me hand it over to Pete. Looking forward to learning more about Sparker over there. in the mic here. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it's really great to be here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, creepiness. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> also kind of usefulness. Um, and I hope you've had your coffee because I'm going to be starting with a poem. Um, <laughs> from Richard Rattigan back in 1967. So this is all watched over by machines of loving grace. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony, like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think, right now please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think, it has to be, of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature, return to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. <laughs> so is that more creepy or is that more inspiring? <laughs> and I, I, honestly, I honestly don't know. I go back and forth on this. Um, <laughs> But it feels like it's coming, <laughs> sort of, you know, all of the things that we're building as a community around AI, um, we're starting to blur the boundaries between what's a person, uh, what's a, you know, a living being, and what's something that we've built. So we're coming into this world where um, it's eerie. Uh, is one way of putting it. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot smarter people than me who have, you know, ever since Mary Shelley with Frankenstein um, or, you know, looking at people like Philip K. Dick, uh, you know, with Do Androids Dream of Electra Sheep and a lot of his other work. Um, there's been lots of people who have been exploring this um, as we get more sophisticated about how we build things. Um, we do start to enter into this world where we're really blurring the lines and it gets harder to tell like what's alive um, and what's not. Um, the particular area that I'm most interested in um, because it's where I'm working is um, how computers understand us. Um, because the history of the last you know, 70 years, say, has been that computers have been really good at showing us stuff. Um, they've been, uh, you know, starting off with text displays, you know, printing stuff out on printers. Um, graphics came, you know, pretty early on in the 60s. Uh, graphics has just kept 
getting better. Um, things like voice synthesis have been around uh, since the 80s. Um, and, you know, especially over the last few years, uh, the graphics capabilities um, and the audio capabilities have become uh, kind of mind-blowingly good. Uh, you know, if you've ever used uh, recent VR, um, it, you know, it will scare you. It will, <laughs> it will make you feel like you are in this world. So computers have really been good at pushing stuff to us. Um, and what's interesting about that is that we're actually quite used to inanimate objects communicating with us, talking to us. You know, ever since, you know, cave paintings or, you know, representational art, books, um, we're grown quite comfortable with this idea that you can kind of capture a voice in an object and it can actually communicate with you. Um, so that sort of stuff doesn't feel that creepy to most people. It's just kind of like, oh yeah, it's kind of like TV, or it's like a book, um, or it's like a record, um, but it's kind of a bit more dynamic and it's kind of controlled by computers. Um, but what does start to get um, creepier is uh, when computers are actually starting to understand what we're saying to them, because we've not had objects like that before. Um, and if you think about computer input compared to computer outputs, like graphics and you know, text and things like that, um, you know, we started off with punched cards. Uh, we, or oh, actually, we started off with toggling, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, switches on, uh, you know, the front of a big computer. We moved on to pun punched cards; they were a big advance. We moved on to teletypes, you know, being able to actually type in. Uh, then we moved on to text displays with CRTs that we could type into. Um, then we had mice and graphical user interfaces. Um, we uh, advanced to touch screens. Um, and, you know, the kind of the current state of the art is what I see as kind of the first generation of voice interfaces, where you're kind of almost got kind of a command line where you're yelling kind of commands to Alexa to, you know, turn living room lights on or something like that. Um, and uh, so we've had this big gap in how computers have been able to understand us, and we've had to kind of bend over backwards to figure out how to talk to computers in a way that they can actually understand us. Um, and that feels a lot like our experience with other machines, you know, other inanimate objects. We've always had to, um, you know, figure out how to use, like, uh, you know, the uh, accelerator and brake and clutch and gear shifter and steering wheel and, uh, you know, indicator uh, wands uh, in order to drive a car. So, you know, that's something we associate with machines is we know we kind of have to make the leap um, to talk in a language that they understand. Um, but what's happening now, um, and I'm actually going to start passing uh, this, this little uh, device around, um, and what you're seeing in this little uh, short video here is a, um, one of the, the first product we've actually brought out is what we're calling this person sensor, and that's this little uh, board here. Um, in this case, it's attached to, uh, you know, an Arduino, basically, to, you know, do stuff with it. Uh, the rest of it is actually a um, TV remote control. So it actually uh, pauses and plays your TV when you sit down in front of it or when you get up from the couch to get a cup of tea. Um, so I've just turned this on. What you'll see, hopefully, is when you hold it so that the wires coming out of the board are upright, um, you should see a green light coming on that tells you, hey, it's seeing a face. Um, so I'll start this in the row here if you just want to 
you know, pass that around. If yeah, if you hold it with the wire up and then point it at your face with the camera, uh, you should see a green light come on. So yeah, with the wires as um, from the top. So you've got it. Yeah, that, so that should work better. <laughs> um, and what this video is showing, so uh, it tell this little sensor tells you, hey. It's got one wire that's connected to the LED that says, hey, there's a person here. Uh, the other information it gives you is through the I squared C bus, a very simple uh, connection, is, hey, where are the faces? Um, and does some simple face recognition. Um, and you can buy this for, we've released this for $10. Uh, we launched this uh, last month. You can buy this on SparkFun. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I built, using this, this very simple like two servo thing um, that points at you. All it does is use the information from that sensor to actually point at your face. Um, and I actually grew quite attached to this. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's really a, um, it, just that simple behavior of like, oh, I'm going to keep looking at you. Uh, it, it really adds this um, very uh, lifelike, um, kind of cute, but kind of creepy feeling <laughs> to this very, very simple, uh, you know, kind of mechanical and electronic object. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is just kind of the first uh, thing we've put together you know, it's it's very straightforward now to do things like you know face following, face recognition. Um, we're um, introducing a gesture sensor for actually just you know same sort of form factor. You know, ten dollars. Uh, uh, you know, small, um, very easy to add to any device. Um, we should be launching that next month. Um, we're uh, hopefully going to be launching a full speech recognition chip um, in a similar sort of price range and form factor uh, middle of next year. Um, and I'm saying this not just as an ad for <laughs> what we're building, but because if you think about you know, a robot vacuum cleaner that um, you can talk to and it actually responds, um, you can kind of shoo away and it goes away, or you kind of bring it closer and it comes to you. Um, it looks at you. It sort of, you know, tracks you. Um, it maybe follows you around, you know, when I'm eating a, you know, a croissant or something and leaving crumbs all over the floor. Um, <laughs> maybe it follows you around and, like, cleans those up. Um, if you think about the sum of all those behaviors, I mean, that's kind of like a dog. <laughs> Um, and we're going to be entering this world where a lot of the everyday objects we interact with, you know, I, I'm not claiming that we're doing anything that, you know, other people, if they were motivated, could not do. Um, we're going to be entering this world where the, all of these everyday objects have this ability to understand us when we speak to them, have the ability to kind of track us, understand when... We're looking at them, that kind of gaze detection, which is super important um, for human interactions. Um, respond to gestures and kind of, you know, unsaid commands. Understand, like, the context of what's happening. Um, and that's going to be super weird. <laughs> like, it's, it's going to be uh, useful, but it's also going to be... Um, uh, Creepy, um, and uh, you know that's really what I'm trying to focus on uh, in this talk. Um, like one statistic I came across last week, which I love and also blows my mind, is that 79% of Americans think their voice assistants spy on them. So um, you know, I worked at Google uh, for uh, seven years. And some of the work I was doing was providing the ML infrastructure for on-device voice recognition. Um, 
And it was super common that when, you know, friends or family heard about me working on this, I'd hear the same thing again and again. Um, so, you know, I was just talking to my friend about Tunisia and the next day I got all these ads for holidays in Tunisia. Um, what the hell, Pete, are you spying on me? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, my, my response was, no, we just don't even have room on the chips to do that. Um, but I can't prove it to you. Um, you know, it's this very, um, you know, coming back to the previous talk, um, you know, we're deploying all of this stuff and uh, we're not really providing much in the way of actual um, proof for people who care about this stuff that it's not being used maliciously. Um, the other statistic that I really blows my mind when I think about it is so, you know, nearly 80% of Americans think the voice assistants spy on them, but like over 40% of us <laughs> still use them. <laughs> so that's where this kind of balance and this trade off and this tension between creepiness and usefulness really comes in. Because as these devices are becoming more useful, you know, getting these capabilities to understand us, um, the creepiness factor is going, you know, way up at the same time. Um, and it's really, you know, if you think about concepts like the Uncanny Valley, um, this idea that as things kind of become more lifelike, um, as long as they're not fully lifelike, um, they're actually a lot creepier um, and a lot scarier than um, objects which are like, you know, cars or other machines we're used to where um, they uh, are a lot further from pets and people. Um, so we're entering this age of creepiness <laughs> is, uh, you know, one way I think about this. Um, and so what are we going to be doing about this? Um, you know, a lot of you are actively, uh, you know, working in areas where you're likely to be encountering this. Um, you know, a lot of AI use cases require the deployment of technologies that actually let you understand um, people. You know, that's one of the sort of, you know, the core broad use cases of AI. Um, and the more you understand people, the more your systems understand people, uh, the creepier they get. Um, and, you know, one, you know, just to be kind of selfish, one danger is that um, that creepiness causes people to reject the work we're building. You know, that's from kind of, you know, just, you know, our perspective as um, engineers and as developers. Um, you know, from the broader perspective, you know, my fear is that, um, you know, being less selfish, but, you know, we're doing these things because we hope that, that they're going to have some positive impact. They're actually going to make things better uh, for uh, people out there. Um, and if the creepiness factor blocks this, you know, if people rebel against um, the introduction of these kinds of capabilities and these techniques, um, then uh, we're going to lose out on the uh, impact that we could have, the positive impact we could have by deploying these technologies. So um, whichever way you look at it, uh, we really need to be thinking and planning for how to um, address the creepiness. Um, and in my mind, um, you know, I always felt like Google's greatest fear was being seen as creepy. Um, <laughs> and that meant that they were unable to talk about 
the creepiness of a lot of what they were doing um, because they were deathly afraid that that would, um, you know, impact them negatively, like it would impact their public perception. But it, you know, from my perspective, it really felt like um, that was counterproductive because people still felt and feel like a lot of this stuff that, you know, places like Google are doing is creepy. Um, and the fact that nobody actually addresses that in a frank and straightforward way um, just makes makes it seem even creepier, like they've got something to hide. Um, so I'm really hoping that we as a community can actually say, yes, this stuff, a lot of the stuff we're doing is creepy. <laughs> um, and instead of us trying to be kind of the arbiters and the decision makers about what is acceptable, um, we actually should engage the public. You know, one of the most interesting things I've been doing as we've been kind of putting together these uh, sensors um, is we've had people who want to use them in industrial use cases and a lot of them actually have uh, union representatives who are involved very early on with anything that feels like surveillance of their workers. Um, and I really think that there's a lot more we can do about bringing in a whole bunch of the different stakeholders and giving, you know, not just consulting, but actually giving them real power over, you know, for example, in an industrial setting, you've got this person sensor. Um, you could use it to kind of, you know, try and detect if people are slacking off and, you know, hiding in the corner of a warehouse to take a cigarette break or something. Or you could use it to try and make sure that people aren't in dangerous areas uh, where they could get into accidents. And I think that everyone uh, involved, as long as you know, the, like on the union side, they would, be, they would love to protect their members as long as they feel like it's not going to be used as this kind of tool of power over them. Um, and so what I'm really hoping is that we're able to translate things like the, you know, like the guarantees uh, that we were talking about in the last talk. Like, let's figure out how to translate those into uh, things that people... Um, who aren't in this field can understand and can actually make decisions on. Um, you know, I, I honestly actually really struggle with things like federated learning and differential privacy because whenever I try and explain them to people, it usually sounds, you know, who are outside our field, it usually sounds something like, well, we're sending data, but don't worry, <laughs> it's not data you worry, you, you, you know, we, we have this math that tells us that this is not data we have to worry about. Um, and that's ex an extremely tough story to tell. Um, and honestly, people are right to be a bit suspicious of it because it's, it gives, you know, federated learning and differential privacy give very specific guarantees. But, you know, there's loads of things you can do like traffic analysis, aggregating over time, all these other things that can pull out information that people might not want to have shared. Um, so uh, I'm really hoping that we can be uh, very um, engaged with um, politics, legislatures, um, you know, policy makers, people on the uh, legal side. Um, oh, thank you. Um, the FTC has actually got a request for comment, for example, um, that I'm working on with some Stanford colleagues. And one of the key questions they're asking is, should you be able to share data between products? So, you know, the classic example, you know, again, I'm sort of picking on Google because I know them uh, the best. You know, sort of 10, 15 years ago, they launched uh, Google 411. Um, and that was a phone service where you could, you know, pick it up and get information. 
um, you know, do searches effectively. And they explicitly said when they launched it, hey, we're doing this so we can gather voice data so that we can train better voice recognition models. Um, and, you know, that's been very common in the, uh, you know, the AI world as a technique. Um, and what that has meant has been that people have been using a product and at these big corporations, a completely different product has been able to benefit from that uh, consumer data that's been gathered. So, you know, one of the things we're proposing is, hey, you should only be able to use data that's gathered for one product to improve that product. And if you want to do something different, then actually, you know, a lot of what's been happening in the AI world recently anyway has been around places like OpenAI training their Whisper model um, on, you know, 700,000 hours of audio data from the web. Um, a lot of the uh, most interesting advances have come from these data sets that are public anyway. Um, can we, instead of letting kind of big corporations uh, plunder other products in their portfolio to build data sets, can we instead encourage them to either, hey, focus on the data that you can actually gather from your product or even just, you know, buy uh, in a very consent-driven way? Um, or can you instead contribute to big shared data sets that are public that will help the whole industry advance? Um, so that's just kind of like one example of how I really want us to no longer be uh, the decision makers on this. You know, we've had a good run, um, <laughs> but <laughs> nobody trusts us, <laughs> uh, you know, for, for a very, very good reason. Um, and so really thinking about, uh, you know, one of the uh, things I haven't talked about with these sensors is, uh, you know, my research at Stanford um, is actually about smart homes without spying. So that little $10 sensor that you know, can do gesture recognition, you know, hopefully voice recognition, person detection, um, we can actually guarantee that the camera and the audio data is not accessible to the rest of the system. So even if the rest of the system gets hacked, nobody, or even if you don't trust the person that built the product, uh, you know, which is something that kind of big tech companies like Google haven't really absorbed, is that people are using them, like we saw with that 80% statistic, but people don't necessarily entirely trust them. Um, and again, for very good reason. <laughs> um, so can we design systems like that where we can guarantee that nobody can get access to that audio, raw audio or video data, all they get access to is the metadata, um, and this is actually auditable by third parties like underwriters laboratories or, you know, um, you know, other ways of actually getting this out into the world so people can test our claims rather than, you know, like I was saying about the Google thing, I was saying, hey, we're not spying on you, but I can't prove it. Like, let's actually try and build systems where there is some accountability, there is some third party auditability where some of these, you know, guarantees, like I'm talking about, like the last, um, you know, uh, talk talked about, can actually be proven um, and can be understood by uh, the end users. Um, you know, that we have very clear ingredients lists on what we're doing. Um, you know, IoT labels from CMU um, is a really uh, great effort in this direction. Um, and I actually want kind of common sense regulations <laughs> around this. Uh, you know, that's not a very popular thing to say as somebody, you know, working in, you know, sort of the startup and tech world. But I think there are really some opportunities to um, capture the way that people expect and the way that people hope that these systems behave as everyday users and actually see if we can uh, have some uh, rules that kind of just, you know, aren't too burdensome, but just capture some of those ideas. So like the idea that, hey, if you're using one product, 
you don't expect that your data from that product will be used on a completely different product or for ads or for something else. Um, so I've done a lot of talking. Uh, <laughs> I would love uh, to get any questions, either uh, you know now, or I know we're running a bit over time, um, or uh, you know, drop me an email. So I see a question here. Hey, uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, I don't have, um, strictly speaking, questions, but I would like to make two comments. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to applaud uh, what you're doing here as a as a continuation of a the recent British uh, tradition of creating high-level, capable hardware like the Raspberry Pi at you know, irresistible price points, right? That, that's, uh, in a way, very de democratizing. Um, and, and secondly, I, uh, from, from what I can see here, this can be uh, transformative to um, technological and scientific education for, 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 for kids at early age, right? A, a lot of the current... Um, uh, so-called STEM or robotics uh, education at school is uh, right now is like okay if you come within ten centimeters of a sonar sensor then speaker sounds beep okay so 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 so, so that's interesting but very, for a very short time it it takes there is a huge gap between that the speaker says beep to creating high level behaviors that can inspire these kids to consider this as a career path or, or, or creating bigger changes to the world. So I, I think these high-level um, sensors um, can, can, go, can, can contribute in a big way uh, to, to, to increase the confidence of young kids um, in, in creating things that they, they, they want to create right? uh, with, without uh, uh, having to jump over very high barriers. So uh, thank, thank, thank you. To see. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, um, and I was just going to say to that, I, not only young kids, I would love if we could get some members of Congress, like <laughs> putting together Arduino stuff, and just you know, because you get a much better feel for what actually works and what doesn't work if you play with it, versus like hearing somebody like me blather on about it. So, <laughs> I got I, I got a question. So I was a I was an engine director at Google when we launched four one one, and and. Uh, you're absolutely right. The <clears throat> the message out at the time was we were collecting data. Also, it was a very different time, right? People don't remember that Google wasn't always perceived as this big evil empire. It was the darling of the the industry still, so it was easier. But even then, um, the observation I had is that essentially people were asking the wrong questions about it. it you know. It seems obvious today is that we're collecting data. Oh, that's the voice data. But that conversation, that grammar didn't exist at the time. So people were saying, what do you mean? What, like, are you collecting where I live? Are you, you know, <laughs> are you taking the text and doing something with it, right? Um, so that's sort of one challenge that is going to be as you roll out new tech, the grammar, the, the vocabulary does exist to have that conversation. The flip side is also true. The conversation around self-driving, right, the SE levels, in my view, are de defined by technical people that don't understand user experience. Like between two and three, there should be another five levels, for example. So, so we engineers also think we have the, we, our own grammar, but it's not appropriate for the public. And you're going to roll out this creepy stuff, right? How, how, do, how are you going to have that conversation? You're going to start with poem? <laughs> I, I think I think I would get uh, kicked out of anywhere <laughs> if I started with a poem. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, really, what I'm trying to do is get this into the hands of as many people as possible, so that people can experience it for themselves, um, and try and be very, you know, frank about the hey, this is creepy, but this is also uh, potentially useful. Um, and also have stuff to back up, because you know there's that feeling of creepiness, and then people kind of go looking based on that feeling of creepiness to try and find out if there's something to back that up. If we can actually have strong evidence, not just from us, but from people that people trust, like, you know, I've been talking to consumer reports, you know, for example, to um, try and 
get the wider kind of community of people actually playing with this, learning about this stuff, learning about where it's useful. Um, you know, one of the places where we've actually had a bunch of people reaching out to us is around elder care. So uh, people are like, hey, so you can have this thing where we can guarantee that the camera is not accessible, um, you know, that nobody can get access to this camera data, but I can tell, you know, uh, you know, if I'm doing my acti activities of daily living, um, you know, or just tell even if I, somebody's sitting in a room watching TV, um, you know, that's actually useful information that you don't get from motion sensors and door sensors and these other things. So really trying to make the case in as honest a way as possible um, about, hey, this is super creepy. We think it's also super useful. <laughs> and we're not going to, like, you know, we're not going to push this on you. Um, we're going to try and work with the, you know, the stakeholders, um, you know, and, like, uh, the senior community is a great example because they, you know, they rightly have a lot of concerns about being spied on. Um, but I believe either we should be able to assuage those concerns, or if we can't, then we don't do it. <laughs> Which, so that this is really the way that I'm trying to um, approach this, is instead of being this very, um, hey, here's this new thing, you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be installed whether you like it or not, um, actually trying to find the use cases where the usefulness outweighs the creepiness. Um, We'll see. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, question. Mr. Warden. Uh, I, great speech, by the way. I, I was just thinking about how your speech is specifically on you know, researching machines and how they can understand us better. And I was in a, a conversation with Craig Donato. He's the, the CRO over at Roblox. And one of the biggest things with the metaverse is interaction, live interactions with people and how that user experience is driven on facial expressions and like how you interact with one another. It's not just a voice and just a solid face. Well, one of the things that um, I think is a challenge, that they actually said that was their, one of their biggest challenges is actually having that translate through, you know, eye gesture movements, eye ticks, facial expressions, and having a best user experience, just as, you know, I'm sure Zuckerberg is with the metaverse. My question to you is, is how far away do you feel like um, computers are going to be able to derive based off our facial expressions and our, our tone of voice, a best response. So for example, you mentioned the Roomba and you can tell it to stop moving, get on my way. Well, if like it had a camera that could actually see that you're like really upset and you had this furious voice, is it gonna react in a different way? I know that like even call centers do that. Like it's like, get me to customer service right now. It'll like get you to level one severity or whatever. Like they do that. But how far are we away from that from practical applications in the modern world? and modern devices and things? So I think from the technical aspect, um, I've, seen, I've seen this working. Like you say, like the call center you know, example, um, there's a lot of, um, like a lot of that stuff exists. Um, I think this is a case where kind of the creepiness, because it's not 100%, that mean, and because we are so, like, sensitive um, to, uh, you know, unless you're sort of, you know, on the autistic spectrum, like, uh, you know, neurotypicals are incredibly sensitive to uh, emotional cues. So if you get an emotional cue wrong one time in 20, it, it, it just... It's just super weird because you've got this thing that seems like it's actually responding to you in a very lifelike way, and then it just does something like that's you know completely inappropriate <laughs> because it has no common sense. And um, most of the situations where people have tried to apply this, it's actually been um, it's you know it suffered from that problem even like kind of little demos in booths where you have to kind of go up, go up and smile or frown or you know and get some reaction like that um, 
I've seen those go wrong enough that people are just like, um, so it really feels like a, a user um, experience. Like the, the technology is there to do this stuff. I'm trying to figure out how to get the user experience right. You know, maybe there's a, something where you suggest something for your, you know, avatar's expression based on, you know, what you think you see. But then you have this step of somebody actually, you know, clicking a button to approve it so that you, you don't kind of, you know, and I'm not sure exactly, you know, that's just me throwing out something on the fly. Um, but yeah, so that, that, those are my thoughts on that, if that makes sense. Okay, I, want to, I want to make one comment. Uh, so I think as engineers, you're not thinking hard enough. So having a camera is an easier solution to a problem where if you don't directly instrument, you can find alternate solutions. So for example, in the elder care case, you could instrument the furniture so that you can still know where the person is. What you said earlier sort of reminded me of this work that we did with the factory in Japan where you can't directly instrument any worker. So we look at the operational data from the machine itself to try and infer things about the operator. Right? So I think we also need that kind of a thinking to say we will not do this. And once we are bounded by that, the solutions that we come up with might be much more acceptable to the wider public. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great point. And you know, this is one of the reasons why I really like bringing in the stakeholders so that they can set the constraints like that. So that they can, you know, because that, you know, often that forces us to be quite innovative. <laughs> and honestly, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to work within constraints sometimes <laughs> as an engineer. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for, you know, if people are saying, no, camera's too creepy, I just don't want it at all, accept that and kind of, you know, we can come up with creative new approaches. So yeah, thanks, Pete. Appreciate the time to talk about creepy, useful <laughs> sensors. No, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>